class to the past And the ladies cross the ages Falling fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the bottle said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome, one and all, to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass, pull up a chair, as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, passing among our ranks are the likes of princes and paupers, purinists, and practical skeptics. And, of course, right here, joining me at the bar, James Waldo, geologist extraordinaire, and Mr. Jason Pintrail, my brothers in arms. How are we doing, fellas? Fine this evening, sir. Happy to be back in the Cross Time Pub. Hard not to be feeling good in the Cross Time Pub. You know, my friend Mike called me the other day, and he said he'd been listening to episodes of the show. And he asked, he said, do you guys record every episode in that pub? I'm just going to have to leave some things a mystery, folks. We'll leave that to the imagination of the listener. Yeah, the pub is where the heart is. Now, Jason, I know with a bit of flint napping that you've been undertaking lately, you must have arrowheads on the mind, because if I didn't know any better, I'd think that that was a Strongbow cider that you're drinking there instead of a Guinness. It is. Uh, branching out and in, in complete uh, honesty here, I ran out of Guinness and everything else, and this belongs to my wife, um, but it's pretty good, um, 6%, so you know there's something to be said for that. And if I'm going to drink a cider, I guess Strongbow's as good as any. Have you guys seen, though, where they will blend ciders with stouts and do these blends? Are you into that? No. <laughs> I've tried them, to be honest, and actually the first time I had Strongbow was in Scotland. Um, we were on the last leg of our, our trip that has, we were driving around the country there and, uh, we were pulling into, um, well, actually we were in Sterling and we went to this little pub and they had a uh, strong bow in there. That's the first time I ever tried it and it was really good. And so I kind of, you know, stuck in the back of my mind because I hadn't seen it here in the States. And then it seems like as soon as we got back, I saw it everywhere and I'm like, Oh, that's the same thing that we had there. So um, but yeah, now they make all kind of different ones and different flavors and things, but they all seem to be pretty good. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the earliest reference, though, that I saw to one of these blended beers, it wasn't actually, again, taking two beers and blending them, which is kind of popular these days. Um, you might see probably the most popular iteration of this as being the black and tan, where they'll take a pale ale, traditionally, sometimes a lager or something like that, and they'll blend it with Guinness but or any other kind of a stout. But uh, I remember in Diamonds Are Forever, the James Bond novel by Ian Fleming, uh, James Bond goes to lunch with a friend early in the novel, and they order what are called black velvets, which are Guinness and dry champagne blended together. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, and I thought, that sounds disgusting, but I've got to try it because I went through this kick back in the day. I used to have a website with Christopher McCollum called Culture of Spirits, and so we would, in fact, actually, if anything, the continuation of that site seems to have occurred here in the Cross Time Pub because we talk about you know, blending and the, I think the culinary aspect of, of beverages and fine beverages and things on this podcast a lot for that reason. But anyway, so we tried it and actually it's quite a tasty beverage. The thickness and the creaminess of Guinness with the tanginess of that the champagne adds. I actually thought it was a nice beverage, but the black and tans are quite more popular these days. If you go into a bar that has a lot of beer on tap and you order a black and tan, most bartenders will know what you're asking about. And yes, now I'm seeing Strongbow and Guinness mixed together too. But the true purist would say, you never mix anything with Guinness. That's <laughs> blasphemy, you see? Blasphemy. You know, Tommy Condon's in Charleston, South Carolina, the Irish pub where, Micah, you and I first had our, our very first drink together, and yep. which was Guinness. Um, I want to say they used to have a drink on the menu, and I don't know if they still do it. I believe it was called the Three Star, and it was three separate layers of, um, I want to say, Bass, Newcastle, and Guinness. But you had three distinct layers in the glass, and you had all three of those beers I believe it was called the three star. Um, somebody happens to be working around that area and knows better than me. Please let us know. But uh, it was an old time favorite. I used to get it pretty often back in the day. But um, these days, I don't really care for the blending. I don't care for the mixing. I just guess I'm getting older now that I'm 40. I just want my regular old Guinness the way it comes right out of the tap. Listen to this guy. You're just over the hill, 40 <laughs> years old. All you can drink is Guinness. James, what are we going to do with this guy? Yeah, I don't just just keep drinking the cider, man. You'll be all right. <laughs> keep drinking uh, the cider. <laughs> hey, Jason, I do want to know though real quickly because uh, later in the program, of course, we're going to be talking about our favorite subject, Atlantis. Well, now for those Atlantis enthusiasts out there, let me give a caveat. Okay, a very skeptical discussion that in part deals with Atlantis 
And with one of the leading skeptics and experts on that subject today, Ken Fader, also Sarah Head will be joining us. But before we get to that, I do want to know, Jason, how your adventures in flint napping went recently. Oh, they're actually coming along pretty good. Um, I have a, a mentor here, uh, Frankie Norris, a great guy, uh, well known within the, the North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia region, Virginia, uh, for his flint napping skills, uh, old time collector. But yeah, he's been doing it for many, many years. Um, has a little little building out back of his house called the uh, Nap Shack. And uh, he just has people from all over the region come there to learn. He, he's done lessons and things in the past, but he's been very generous with his time and, and uh, skill and showing me some of the finer uh, touches, if you will, of, of making some of the, uh, the different lithic types. So, yeah, um, I've got my little studio set up in the garage here at my house. I've got plenty of rock to practice on and um, already getting a lot better. Um, I had a you know cursory knowledge of it before, but I certainly understand the process much better now. And uh, it really aids when you're um, identifying lithics and understanding the different flaking patterns and all that. But uh, it definitely, you know, you can kind of knock one out pretty crudely, but, you know, you, you really begin to appreciate the fine skill that's involved with, with napping when you understand exactly the little intricacies of making one really sharp, really well refined, nice and thinned out making a beautiful biface there's a lot more to it than you would imagine oh well i have at least a cursory idea of this and james i don't know if you ever tried flint napping i certainly haven't done it as, as much as jason has but i have tried by hand at it in fact i showed uh one of my early attempts from when i was 10 or 11 years old to you in a photograph recently jason uh, that's right yeah but i also have dc waldorf's book the art of flint napping which is a wonderful it's not a very long book but it is i have to say very comprehensive in terms of explaining all the different kinds of flaking patterns. And just reading that book, even if you never pick up a piece of rhyolite or anything like this, and keep in mind, folks, if you do want to try your hand at this, what we advise is buy your stone online or find a dealer near you where you can purchase it. That way you know you're getting something that you're legally able to have. Because if you, for instance, go to one of the state-protected quarry sites. We, of course, at Seven Ages have visited a lot of these. Flint Ridge in Ohio, we've gone to, of course, Topper down there in South Carolina, and we were accompanied by the archaeologist who excavated that area, Dr. Albert Goodyear. Now, we've gone to a lot of quarry sites, but unless you have permission, often there are federal laws that prevent you from being able to remove any kind of lithic stone artifact or anything from those sites. So don't just go out and think that you can go to a national forest and start taking rocks. It's pretty specific the way you're supposed to get this stuff if you're going to use it for flint napping. Now, that said, again, without ever having picked up a stone, you can read a book like Waldorf's, and it will teach you so much about the mind of the ancient people who were using this stuff. And that's what I find really fascinating. But I do want to try my hand with it. And, and now that I know that you're doing it uh, semi-professionally, learning from some of the very best, Jason, i got to get down there to the sunken city of Relay, try this out again. Oh, yeah, man. You'll pick it up fast, I think. And James, you'll appreciate it, too, being a geologist. But, you know, every stone's different, and everyone has a different characteristic. Everyone's, you got to get a feel. You know, obsidian feels completely different than rhyolite, which feels completely different than chert. So, you know, each one's got its own feel. Each one's got its own texture, and you'll learn the intricacies of, of each one. Be forewarned, though, our obsidian will tear you up, man. It doesn't take much to, to make yourself bleed with that stuff. And you'll you'll see exactly why ancient people preferred those almost glass-like stone varieties because i mean they really do cut <laughs> it's no joke yeah, yeah <laughs> obsidian they'll take you down to the bone man yeah well it's i mean it's glass and i've never tried uh, flint napping however i have i have whittled a few sticks in my time i used to do that a lot yeah, that was another thing my mother taught me at an early age that uh you know where you would fire treat wood you know is, is your yeah. is your carving like a i would i would make spears from wood when i was a child or i guess what uh, in uh england they would have been called in the middle ages pole arms right just long you know yeah yeah spears for self defense and and we would fire treat them you can harden them in a fire you know as you get them down to an almost kind of an ashy layer and everything and i would so i'd carve them down and then i would harden them and when i was a kid i'd run around in the woods with these spears and try not to poke my neighbor's eyes out and things like that but my other favorite, though, was we would find where a storm had rushed through and it would, it would you know, take over an old pine tree. And I used to love to do this. I would take a great big, long, split timber of pine that was, again, if you, if you took the, the, uh, the trunk of the tree, and let's say that you went from the, from the exterior of any point in about th uh, two inches, and then you just cut a great big wedge off of that so it's flat and very thin, 
you may be able to see where I'm going with this. I would I would carve broadswords out of that. And I would run around. I, of course, if it's pine, you know, there can be a lot of sap and stuff, so you had to let it dry out really well. But but I loved to find an old broken piece of wood like that that was nice and flat. You know, you had a an excellent yeah. and, and just carve and I would I would look at um, I would get, uh, you know, Graham Bass, I believe, was the author who did all the books on castles and things with the just brilliantly illustrated books that looked at every aspect of these ancient structures and things. And I loved those things when I was a kid. And I also had a lot of books on ancient weaponry. And so I would find different kinds of swords, broadswords, bastard swords, you know, cutlasses, things like this. And I would try and emulate them through carving. So in addition to whittling, James, yeah, I, I would carve all of these weapons from antiquity and imagine what was it like to be a member of the Roman Legion? You know, what would it have been like to be defending against the King of Kings, Xerxes, with the 300? I mean, things like that. I was just fascinated with ancient weaponry. Now we've got to do a show about that, guys. Yeah, that would be a cool show. But, you know, if you'd actually been in the one of those ancient armies, they would have given you a real sword and not a, not a pine sword. Right, indubitably. Yeah, I wouldn't have used the wooden sword. That would have been the training sword before they gave you the real deal. But, you know, speaking of ancient weapons... So there was big news out of Texas recently at the famous Galt site. Now, Jason, the Galt site, which is, I believe, northeast of Austin, Texas, it's been our, on our radar for a long time. You knew about it, and you had some excellent literature about this. And in fact, there was a book, I believe, that was published by Texas University that talked about excavations at Galt. The very first thing that drew our attention to Galt, I'll let you tell folks about this, there was a very peculiar kind of lithic type that was found in the Clovis horizon, and when you spotted it, I was sitting across the table from you during a research session, and I saw Jason's eyes grow wide and his jaw dropped, and then I was beckoned from across the table and made to come over and look at a photograph, and again, what I saw was irrefutably out of place. Jason, you want to tell us what we found? Yeah, the book we're referring to is called uh, Clovis Lithic Technology, uh, Investigation of a Stratified Workshop at the Galt Site in Texas. Um, Again, that book is uh, on Texas A&M University Press, um, featuring prominently Michael Waters and Charlotte Pevney, as well as David Carlson. Um, but in that book, it's basically going through the story of what we knew about Galt up to that point and all the excavations that had taken place at that site. Um, and it's exactly what it says in the book. It's a stratified workshop, which is a very unique uh feature to be able to find archaeologically. So what you have there is just an immense amount of debutage and artifacts and cores and all kinds of things that you find in one spot. Um, generally, you don't find them in concentrations like you find at the Galt site. So it's very, very unique. And uh, what's really interesting about it is it's a site that just keeps producing. Um, every time you think you're kind of getting to the, the baseline story there, it keeps changing. And just to make it that much more interesting, as we were flipping through it, we saw the indication of what's to us and here in the southeast we refer to as a redstone um, which is extremely rare and important type here in south carolina north carolina this general region tennessee um, so redstones are extremely rare and to see one that far which is you know as far as we knew that's as far as it had ever been found west and so finding one at the galt site you know it was you know just an absolute surprise i actually wrote michael waters about that and he replied, in, and I was basically was, uh, inferring about the, well, you know, why is it there? It shouldn't be there as far as we know. And, and what does that say about where it was found? Because it was found at the lowest level with other Clovis artifacts. And what we know about the redstone is that it should be post-Clovis, at least to some degree. Um, so it, it didn't seem to make sense in that context. But his, his reply to me was, it is what it is. So uh, that kind of just left it hanging. And, and actually, Dr. Albert Goodyear, um, who we accompanied to the Topper site, he had actually been out there and asked Dr. Waters about that exact same thing and got a very similar reply. So uh, needless to say, as much of a mystery as that was for us looking through that, that book and, and spotting that, that artifact, uh, the Galt site has again continued to bring forth more information and Micah, you covered this in a new article at Seven Ages, did you not? I did indeed, yeah. And just a couple of quick uh, addendas to what you were talking about there. Again, the redstone, very similar to another point top that's found throughout the Midwest called Ganey. And then if you go further up the northeastern coast, there's another kind, uh, the Debert point, in reference to the Debert uh, site, which I believe is uh, in uh, eastern Canada. You know, again... You'll find that sometimes the same point type essentially has different names in different regions. 
And as the guys have pointed out for me here, I mean, uh, the Redstone type site is in Alabama. Uh, but then again, it's essentially identical to other types that are found in the United States with different names in different regions, if you follow me there. The most important thing about it is that although at that time we'd never found evidence of a redstone found, to my knowledge, really, not only that far west, but anywhere west of the Mississippi, really, I don't think that according to the PIDBA, the Paleo-Indian database, that we'd found many out that far west on a um, on a message forum about arrowheads, I did find reference to a person saying they found what appeared to be a gainy in West Texas, but there was no image that accompanied it. So Jason and I, we were treating this like a real mystery. There was a redstone. It was found further west than any that we've seen photographic documentation of or anything other than just an anecdotal mention like what I saw on said website. And then furthermore, like you mentioned, Jason, it was, and we thought that there was a typo. I mean, it was clearly in the Clovis strata. Yeah. And I mean, we did actually find one little, um, one little typological error in the, in the publication. They had reversed a couple of the lithic drawings from that assemblage. And so it made me wonder, I thought, could they have gotten something wrong? No, it appears indeed that the redstone did come from the Clovis horizon. This was confirmed by Albert Goodyear, who we had on a program recently, along with Dr. Chris Moore here on the podcast. So we confirmed that much, and then we kind of put it out of our mind. We were like, well, that made that site really cool, and that's that's going to be noteworthy, at least to us, if not to everybody else who, who looks at these kind of things. Lo and behold, a few weeks ago, we see this new paper in Science Advances. And guys, yet again, we're seeing the hashtag dig deeper at work. Below the Clovis horizon, they keep going on down. They, they go down, actually, in what the photographs show, down to the bedrock in many instances, and the latest uh, dating technologies uh, used at Galt, not just radiocarbon dating, but also optically stimulated luminescence, I believe. These dates are now showing on the far end, just to illustrate how old things could be. The oldest dates show in excess of 21,000 years ago, but conservatively, at very least, on the nearer side of 16,000 plus so, once again, we've got a pre-Clovis site. We've got one that's at very least on par with Meadowcroft Rock Shelter, but in likelihood is on par with places like Bluefish Caves and, yes, even Topper. And they have found quite a remarkable array of pre-Clovis lithics at this site. And, you know, a couple of them, they're broken, they're fragmentary, probably part of the reason that they were left behind. But we were looking at the basal end of one of these that, to me, looked very much like a redstone but without a flute. And it really makes you wonder, I mean, what kinds of, of point types were being made? How long certain ideas were being put in place? We know that the flute is exclusively Clovis. But this Science Advances article, and we, again, if you head over to 7ages.org, you can see the article there at the site about the Galt site. And, it, and, and I actually gave some footnotes about the morphological characteristics of some of these early point types and why we think, as 7 Ages, the team, in terms of our interest in these things, why we think they're interesting. Um this is one of the most extraordinary North American archaeological discoveries that I personally have seen in years. You know, we read this paper about Galt, and there's been some others, and it, it, it occurred to me that, you know, you hear about the Clovis people quite a bit. What occurred to me was maybe that it's not necessarily was a Clovis people, but it's more just a technology. You know, what, what we call Clovis or what we call a redstone wasn't really uh, – didn't belong to a certain group of people. It was it was just a technology that eventually was shared, and that's why you've got similar points in different parts of the North America that are that are called different things. Absolutely, and in fact, the authors of the paper, uh, Michael Waters, I believe, being one of them, uh, they specifically say that what we see here is a long-standing presence and different lithic types over time, and then we see the very clear, irrefutable Clovis horizon. It's reliably dated. Uh, and, and we can compare that with other Clovis sites in the region so we know that this is Clovis and that we have the time and the space correct. And so with that kind of context, what this shows is that there were plenty of people here, but when the Clovis technological horizon appears, there wasn't a culture that appears. What this is is there is a technological revolution that occurs, an industrial revolution of sorts in North America twelve to 13,000 years ago, and that it was diffused among existing cultural groups that were already present for who knows how long. Now we don't right. know how we don't know how widespread. We don't know in what parts where and who. There's still obviously a lot of questions, but again, what we're learning from sites like Galt is that sure, before Clovis there were plenty of people here. There was a long history of people having been there. 
And when Clovis came along, it was a technology that became prevalent. It was not a group of people moving into the area, as once thought. So, yeah, Clovis, I think we can safely say, rather than being a culture, it's a Clovis technology that was used by many different groups. Yeah, it's a it's a cultural. It's a, exactly what you said. It's a cultural technology. I believe that's that's spread out through various areas. Now, what's interesting about it is not only does it add to uh, the mystique of this particular culture, but now we can't necessarily uh, determine where it started. So, you know, uh, typically you say, well, people came down the West Coast. Okay, well, they didn't go through the ice sheets. That's out. Let's say they used watercraft. So, did they come? and then spread from the West Coast to the East Coast or vice versa. But because we're talking about a lithic technology, we don't really know exactly where it started per se. Yeah, it right. seems to have happened instantaneously enough, though, that again, you know, when you find the so-called Clovis horizon, geologically, the strata always indicates essentially the exact same time period. You're going to find Clovis in this period with rare exceptions, one of those being that there was a Clovis point that was found up in the uh, Pacific, well, not the Pacific Northwest, but it was in the Northwestern uh, United States uh, a couple of years ago, and uh, there was a science paper that was written on this. Um, Michael Moreno, I believe, maybe was one was the author of that, but I'm I'm drawing this from memory. Jason, you remember us talking about it. <laughs> sometimes the lines between these different lithic types, and sometimes also the uh, the ages from which they they come, they do get a little blurry. And again, it's it's kind of like Redstone versus Clovis. For the longest time, Redstone slash Ganey slash DeBert was just considered a Clovis point until people get, began to realize, ah, there are distinctive differences between this type. You know, th this one's a lot more trianguloid. This one's got a deeper concavity on the base. The flaking patterns are slightly different. And so, you know, again, often I think what we're looking at are transitional types that are showing us little indications of new technological directions that are occurring, you know, over a short period of time, and they help us date what people were doing at that time. So what we definitely know is we can track the lithics and we can date those very reliably, but it still leaves an awful lot of questions about the people who were using these tools, and that's the real mystery. We still have so many questions about what was their life like? What was their culture like? You know, what were their habits? Did they have any kind of language? We haven't found any kind of, and by that I mean a written language, we haven't found a whole lot of evidence of things like those, let alone bodies, with the exception of Anzic I, an infant that was buried, I believe, in Montana. Is that right, Jason? Yep, in Montana. That's yeah. correct. But then, you know, you, you throw in the anomalies like the Western stem points that look to be contemporary of Clovis or possibly even slightly pre-Clovis, and that's a completely different uh, shape. That's a completely different style. So, I mean, you're looking at a stemmed point versus a lancelet point like you see with a with a clovis so i mean there you go again you have a, a regionality there something that's that's a regional in nature but completely different from what is being done by everyone else in the continent at that time it's just fascinating this is the reason that archaeologists in north america especially are so fascinated with these arrowhead point types they're one of the only reliable ways stone being something that doesn't deteriorate easily over time like wood and other perishable technologies it's one of the very few things that we can still have from the ancient past that shows us things about their way of life and that we can reliably date through the soil that they're found in. You know, one thing that I have learned probably in the last year or so, I'd never been to any artifact shows before we started the Seven Ages project here. But one thing that really has kind of struck me is just this sheer volume of artifacts that people have found and it's, that have just been out there. If you're not familiar with this, um, folks, if you've never been to one of these shows, you just think, you know, there's like these small bands of people and, they, you know, they might have had small camps or they, you know, were, were nomadic and they moved around. But there had to just, there had to be just loads and loads of people in North America and, and prehistory. There were definitely a lot of people around. And, of course, in the next segment, we'll talk about exactly who and where, among other questions, with Ken Fader and Sarah Head. They're the co-hosts of the Archaeological Fantasies podcast. Of course, we're going to be talking with them about pseudo-archaeology, in other words, pseudoscience in the field of archaeology, why you should be wary of it, and how it can even be dangerous at times. This is something that we think about and talk about an awful lot, especially as we enrich our minds with the actual reliable historical data that archaeology has to offer us and that the Seven Ages guys are in pursuit of and try to promote on this podcast and with all of our endeavors. 
And with that, of course, in mind, be sure to head over to sevenages.org. Check out the article on the Galt site that we mentioned earlier. James Waldo has been working, doing yeoman's work, getting all of our podcasts available on YouTube, so you can now tell your friends about those. And, of course, check us out on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook as well. And you're welcome, of course, to email us at any time, Micah, Jason, or James at sevenages.org, not .com, but .org. We got an email from Francois B. Ulrich the other day. And he writes to us, he says, Hi, I was Googling the Serpent Mound to go back with the homeschool co-op that I lead, and I found your post. I was there too, back in October of 2018. It was the date of the 17th. Now, I went alone that day. I got there late in the day, around maybe 3 or 4 p.m. I went to the museum. There was a lady with abnormally large hands manning the counter. (laughs) And then he says, I heard it as I walked out. Were you there at the same time, or were there two distinct and possibly loud booms at Serpent Mound? Now, Francois, I don't know. That's a very good question. But uh, as he writes to us, of course, he seems to be describing having been there on the same date that we were and having heard one of those loud booms that we talked about. Very interesting. What day were we there? Well, he references October 17th, 2018, and he's talking about an article I wrote about that. I'm trying to remember if we, I know it was in October that we were up there. Jason, do you happen to know what the date was? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't have the exact date, but uh, we were there for the boom because as soon as we got out of the car, that's the first thing that we heard. And it definitely startled all three of us as we're looking up to the sky trying to figure out where it came from. Yeah, so Francois thinks he was there on the very same day that we were, a minor synchronicity there. And I'm glad that you uh, found out about our work, and hopefully, Francois, you'll be keeping up with us as well. So good to hear from you and anybody out there if you'd like to send us an email again just pick one of our names, Micah, James, or Jason at sevenages.org. You can also send us a message through Facebook, or you can tweet at us at the number seven, Ages Research. So, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. Now, with that, I'm sure that folks are probably eager to hear about our conversation with Ken Fader and Sarah Head. We're going to get into a lot of interesting things and some weird stuff, too. Ancient aliens, Atlantis, but we're going to take a level-headed approach. A conversation with skeptics here when we return on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. reliable evidence that Earth has been visited by alien beings in the ancient past? And if so, have they influenced cultures over time? Well, as far as evidence for these things, it's pretty paltry, and yet these nonetheless remain popular ideas, even in this era of modernity. And so tonight, we are joined by two commentators on pseudo-archaeology. Sarah Head has over 14 years in the field and lab with a BA in anthropology and a master's of science certificate in GIS remote sensing with a focus in archaeology. She's also finishing a master's degree in cultural resource management archaeology next year and has been debunking bad archaeology and pseudoscience since 2007 and has frequently spoken publicly on that subject. Our other guest tonight is Ken Fader. He's a full professor of anthropology at Central Connecticut State University in New Britain, Connecticut, and his primary research interests include archaeology of the native peoples of New England and the analysis of public perceptions about the human past. Now, Ken is the author of a number of books, which include Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries, Science and Pseudoscience in Archaeology, The Past in Perspective, An Introduction to Human Prehistory, and Ancient America, 50 Archaeological Sites to See for Yourself. Now, his upcoming book, Archaeological Oddities, A Field Guide to 40 Claims of Lost Civilizations, Ancient Visitors, and Other Strange Sites in North America, is scheduled for publication in 2019. Now, Ken has served as a commentator on numerous television documentaries, many of which I've seen, about the human past, and is also a co-host of the Archaeological Fantasies podcast, which we'll be talking about tonight. So welcome to both of you. Ken, I have to, of course, right here off the bat, mention the fact that we saw you mentioned in the New York Times recently, and this in relation to an article on a popular conference which celebrates, I think, really the epitome of pseudo-archaeology. And um, it was a very interesting right. perspective that you gave on that subject. So first of all, congratulations for appearing in the national media. Certainly not your first time. Yeah, I, I guess congratulations are in order. Um, 
you know, I've been on a number of, of TV shows where the producers have said to me that that my 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 role is as a beacon of sanity in a sea of madness, <laughs> and so I kind of that, that I think in the New York Times article that's what I ended up feeling like being that that was my role um, because it was there was a you know listen it was some pretty weird stuff and I have actually never been to an alien con or a comic con or whatever the other cons are um, and I found I found the, the the description of what was, what goes on there kind of interesting. But ultimately, it's you know obviously sad and depressing when you devoted your life to to the study of the human past, and you find folks who that's not enough for them. They want something else entirely, and something that's not not fact based, not reality based. And so that can be kind of depressing. But you know that's why guys like me can write books and and uh, and include lectures in our classrooms about this kind of stuff. So. I, I suppose on some level there's a symbiotic relationship between me and the crazy people, but that's the way it goes. Well, yeah, certainly. And, of course, I, we talk a lot, the Seven Ages team, and I, we will go to events where we're, of course, talking about archaeology, and people always want to talk about ancient aliens, for instance. I'm actually amazed at how many grad students come up to us and talk about how that is a guilty pleasure of theirs. Now, I personally uh, have met some of the so-called stars of the show, and I don't want to disparage anybody. I'm just not very impressed with their theories. Archaeology, on the other hand, is something that is available to everyone, and there is a plethora of data. I know that you in the New York Times piece mentioned that you early on had read some ancient astronaut literature and that this kind of drove you toward archaeology, but you adopted, again, what science has to say about those things. Let's talk about yeah. those earlier years for a moment. Here's, here's, this, is my, uh, this is my embarrassing story, is I was in college... And you know, man, I'm I am an old guy, so I was uh, a freshman in college in 1969. When I, I tell my students that 1969, they say, "You mean 1869?" I said, "No, no, no, 1969." <laughs> um, and I had gone off to college, and it was kind of crazy years when people say, "Were the 60s and 70s like that?" I said, "They must be, because I don't remember about a decade's worth of that time." Um, and so I, my hair was like insanely crazy, and my parents were all upset. They sent me off to a. Uh, uh, um, uh, it wasn't a barber shop. It was a unisex hair salon that was big back in the day, and um, it was in fact the, the hairstylist who was cutting my crazy hippie hair. Who, when I said to her, "Hey, listen, you know," it was, she said, "What do you do?" And I said, "Well, I'm a student. I'm, um, I'm going into archaeology." She's the one who said to me, because I'd never heard of it before. Oh, what do you think about that guy who says that? Um, the Egyptian pyramids were actually built or helped uh, helped to be built by people from outer space. And I had never heard of that before. And I basically, you know, I summoned my most intelligent answer, which was, huh? And <laughs> she said, no, oh, I thought you're an archaeology student. Haven't you, don't you talk about this in class? And I said, no, in all honesty, actually not. And then, so I just kind of wrote it off and forgot about it. And it was when I, uh, several months later, and I was back at school and it was a real late night. Back back in that day, even in those days, I was actually doing work late at night, and uh, there was a, um, I think it was public radio was on, just a, you know, oral um, wallpaper, and I picked up on the fact that somebody was, was reading a review of a book called Chariots of the Gods, which again, I had never heard of, but as I was listen, began to listen more closely, it was pretty clear that this person was, that this book was was a pre presentation of this hypothesis that this hairstylist had told me several months before. I said, "Well, I got I have to buy a copy of this book. This is a real thing. This isn't just some crazy story that a hairstylist says. This is a book." And I went out and actually found a copy of the book and read it, and was amazed by it. And here's another one of these huh. really embarrassing um, admissions. There was a time in the life of of us of young boys when because we didn't have the internet and so porn was very difficult to obtain and, <laughs> and well i'm so but listen though listen so so what would happen is that somebody would get a book and would share it with his friends all over this stuff and the 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 phrase that was said over and over and over again was they'd hand you a book and say turn to any page and that meant this was good 
you know, good porn for teenage boys in the 1960s and 70s. And so my reaction to reading Chariots of the Gods was kind of like that. This was a kind of intellectual pornography. It was, oh my God, it's not like, well, there's a little crazy stuff here, but this makes sense. It was turn to any page, and it was all the same absolute nonsense that even I, as an undergraduate student who had taken, at that point, maybe a couple of courses in anthropology and archaeology, and I had been interested in ancient Egypt and in um, the ancient civilizations in the New World, and so I knew a little bit about it. I was certainly wasn't... Um, very well informed, but I knew enough to know that the things that this guy was saying, Eric von Donneken, the author of Chariots of the Gods, just simply contradicted what archaeologists knew about human antiquity. And I think that was the thing that sort of got me going. Or I, then I said, you know, I got this guy has more books, so I'll, I'll buy more of his books. And then realized that, you know, he's not the first person to say this, that he was getting these ideas from other sources. And for whatever reason, it just kind of it interested me not because I thought it was funny or because it was entertaining, but because I really wanted to understand, well, why would people embrace this notion that human that the human past is best understood as the product of interventions by what I call the extraterrestrial Peace Corps, right? Showing up and teaching us how to how to plant crops and how to domesticate animals and how to build large structures. Why do people embrace that? And not what clearly has been shown by archaeologists who study the archaeological record, that as human beings are really smart, really creative, and when they put their minds to it, can, can create and produce and construct amazing things, even in deep antiquity. Um, and I guess I, that, that in, a, in a way, at least for part of my career, that, that defined what part of my career evolved into being. But see, to me, that's a good thing, Ken, and I want to get Sarah's perspectives here in a moment before I toss it to my colleagues, but I mean, let me just say this. I think you are like a lot of us who initially were introduced to that kind of literature, and when I was 17, 18 years old, I too was fascinated with that. But as time goes on and you work with members, again, I'm just an avocationalist, and the Seven Ages team, kind of what we do is avocationalists as we try to popularize actual science as it relates to archaeology, and hence we have you guys on, but... Many of us, this was an introduction for us, but you learn the woes of your past ways and you proceed with more knowledge and more insight into what actually happened, which, of course, in your case, led you to being an educator. So I actually say kudos. It's people who can look at these kind of things and challenge those conceptions rather than taking everything at face value that's so important to me. On the media side of things, Sarah, of course, yeah. this... Oh, I'm as, sorry, as Ken? As, yeah, as long as you don't say that I owe Eric Von Donica a debt of gratitude... No, no. <laughs> for... for, for Pushing me in the in the opposite direction. I think yes, I understand what you're saying. I think you found your way all on your own. <laughs> uh, Sarah, you know, this isn't the only podcast, Archie Fantasies, uh, that you contribute to. You, of course, also contribute to the Women in Archaeology, but obviously this one plays a unique role as it relates to educating the public on the difference between, and I think this is very important, the difference between pseudo-archaeology and what actual historical and archaeological information can teach us about the past. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've had the blog longer. I have a blog under the same name, and I've had the blog longer than I've had the podcast. And about four years ago, um, I was approached with the opportunity to start a podcast based on the blog. And I was like, I just don't think anybody's going to listen to me rant and rave for an hour. And um, the the person who was helping us produce it at the time was like, well, if you could have any, if you could have any dream co-host, <laughs> who would it be? And I was like, well, Carl Sagan's dead, so... <laughs> Um, <laughs> sorry, Ken. So then I was like, what about Ken Fader? Because he was, he's, he's well known for this. And, um, you know, it was really just a shot in the dark. Cause I was like, Ken Fader will never say yes to this. He's like a professional. He teaches, he's like, and, uh, so actually my producer reached out to Ken first with an email and Ken was like, hell yeah. And I was like, seriously? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Hey, Sarah, I never knew that Carl Sagan was your first choice. And for the first time, <laughs> but here's the thing for the first time ever in my life, I can say, I'm pretty glad Carl Sagan's dead. Oh my gosh! <laughs> <laughs> I think this wow. is a very selfish perspective. Yeah, you heard it here first, I folks. Well, this is the only context in which many of us would say that. Allow me just yeah, to interject, yeah. and I'll just interject about Carl Sagan. Even he, early on, from a very scientific perspective, proposed that at least we should be open to the idea of what he, I believe, called paleocontact. Now, granted. 
with such paltry evidence for it, he changed that perspective later on down he the did. Yeah, and he that's did. something that has to be driven home because there are even books that have come out in recent years that continue to try and say that Carl Sagan secretly was an advocate for these kind of ideas. They were things that he, as any good scientist, I think, entertained at an early time in his career. But again, evidence forthcoming changed his mind. Am I correct on that, guys? Absolutely. And and here's the thing, too. I think what the, the, the Sagan uh, wrote an article in, what is it, the Journal of Planetary Sciences, I think it was the 69-ish, in which he talked about that, you know, essentially saying, hey, listen, if extraterrestrial contact has occurred, if extraterrestrials, extraterrestrials landed on Earth, over the four and a half billion year um, story of our planet, the odds are it would have been earlier. They wouldn't be here now necessarily. That's a one in 4.5 billion chance. Probably somewhere, if they arrived here, it may be at some time in the past, and maybe they left behind in geological strata or maybe archaeological strata um, evidence of that. But it, that that belies the claim that scientists are closed-minded and they, they aren't open to new ideas. Carl Sagan talked about this. He published about mm -hmm. this, and right. And but like any other hypothesis, when the evidence is not forthcoming to support, to, we, we, the, we those things have not been found. And so Sagan backed off. It's perfectly okay to to present a hypothesis that's extreme or out there, as long as you are ready and willing to 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 come to the conclusion that the hypothesis is unsupportable because there's no evidence to support it. Right. Yeah, and, and Sagan is an excellent example of that for the reasons that Ken pointed out. And also, you know, later on, Sagan is famously misquoted with the um, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, where he's, everybody always tries to use that to say, well, just because you're not finding it doesn't mean it didn't exist. And it's like, no, actually, that was exactly what he was saying. It, it, he was using it in a, not a sarcastic tone, but when he wrote that frame, um, that phrase out, he was pointing out that too many groups of people use that kind of claim even at that time to suggest that, well, just because you're not finding the evidence you want doesn't mean that this thing didn't actually happen. And he's going, yeah, actually it kind of does. <laughs> yeah, and you see that so much with Carl Sagan because Carl Sagan, people, I think, with the with the the prevalence of his ideas in the American zeitgeist over the course of the last, you know, several decades and even today, it's very easy to be able to borrow his ideas and try to use them in a context that supports your narrative. Jason, I'm sorry, I know you want to get in here. Jump in, bud. No, no, it's just that that line of conversation is actually really interesting to me. Uh, it makes me think about something, uh, you know, along these lines is uh, oftentimes so many of these pseudo archaeological hypotheses are based on really nothing other than someone's opinion or false interpretation of yeah. a, uh, a document or some some tablet that was found somewhere that no one really knows where it came from or who made it. Um, so I can't help but always wonder, you know, why is it that the things that we can prove through archaeology and in good science, they don't seem to have that appeal, but yet the things that are based essentially holistically on someone's opinion uh, seem to have that driving entertainment value. And is it that it answers a question that somebody is, is always tossing around in their head that, you know, why, why are the pyramids there? How did they get there? There's got to be a reason. And if I'm not finding that reason that's satisfactory to me, then it must be X, Y, or Z. So I guess my question is this, how is it that the, the entertainment side of this has such a large appeal when in actuality the the true story of how a lot of these uh, things come about is much more interesting than the entertainment side so why is it that these things have grown things like ancient aliens and all these other shows that are based essentially on nothing what is the appeal of, of that versus the actual archaeology i think it's a multi i mean i think your answer has multi layers to it uh, one of them is it's, it's entertainment, and people love to be entertained. Um, you, you were mentioning earlier, I think, Michael, was that um, people will tell you, oh, I watch Ancient Aliens. It's my guilty pleasure. I mean, yeah. people don't see the harm in it, uh, which we try to point out on the show. But I think another aspect of it is, um, and I think this is the most damning one towards the science, the scientific community as a whole, not just archaeology, but we're guilty of it ourselves, we don't communicate very well with the average person. Um, we we put our research behind paywalls. We it's very rare to find someone who will 
speak openly to the public, not just a select group, but like the public in general. Um, this is why Ken does so well as he does is because Ken will get on the shows and he will talk to the average person and he will speak in a way that the average person can understand. He doesn't use a lot of jargon and he speaks very plainly. Um, it's, it's something that I try to capture on my blog and when I lecture and go to like, I go to Gen Con and I, which I've missed this year. Um, but I go to Gen Con and I will do a, a, a public thing there where people will come and ask me questions about ancient aliens, about the pyramids, about biblical archaeology and that kind of stuff. And I'm there to reach out to those people. And, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but we, we as scientists kind of have the reputation that we have for a reason. And we really need to do a lot more to, to kind of break that down. We don't have fun shows on public tell. I mean, on cable network about archaeology because people think what we do is interesting, but when they start seeing how the sausage is made, they get bored. Yeah, you know, like, right. oh, you're taking an hour to scrape down 10 centimeters of dirt? Yeah, actually I am, and it's really important that I'm doing it, you know? Right, and, and I, I definitely understand where that's coming from, and as a matter of fact, on our last interview, uh, we were interviewing Egyptologist Kara Cooney, and her show on Discovery Channel out of Egypt was actually called Too Educational. <laughs> and, you know, there you go. It was it was too much information and not enough entertainment. God forbid uh, anybody be informational yeah, exactly. as well we as yeah, edutainment. <laughs> yeah. There is such a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, that, that leads down to the, to the next question that I kind of have, and, and as far as this conversation goes, and Ken, I'll, I'll toss this one over to you. Sure. I've heard the argument that these shows and, and these blogs and forums and all this for these pseudo archaeological interests, uh, a lot of people will argue that they can downright be dangerous, like we've talked about here, because they're putting out false information. They're putting these ideas in people's heads so that when they actually hear real information, it just kind of it bores them. It's not what they're looking for. It's not flashy. But then the other side of that argument is some would say that, well, that draws attention to the actual practice of archaeology and sites. Is there any benefit, in your opinion, uh, Ken, to any of these shows that sort of entertain the masses and focus on a pseudo-archaeological discipline rather than actual archaeology? Is there any benefit at all to this? Yeah, my, my answer is a qualified maybe. Um, here's the deal. Uh, from a personal perspective, I will end up with students who register for one of my classes because... They know I talk about ancient aliens or Atlantis or Bigfoot, and they have seen stuff about that on TV, and they don't know that I'm a skeptic. They just say, oh, that's a, that's a cool class. And so, and I'm not going to say that invariably by the time they're done with my classes, they, they, they've seen the light. They've, come, they've had a come to Jesus moment, and now they're going to be devoted um, watchers of science documentaries. But, but, by, but yeah, I mean, so in that sense, sure. People will register for a class for me or for Jeb Card, one of our other host, co-host, or for any one of a number of other folks because they got excited about seeing something on Ancient Aliens and they know, oh, they're going to – they'll talk about Ancient Egypt. They'll talk about um, Atlantis. They'll talk about Stonehenge in that class. And so there is that. There really is, however, a dark underbelly to all of this. Um you know, some of the students of mine in my classes who watch Ancient Aliens, they watch it, at least what they say to me, it's the equivalent of enjoying a good ghost story around the campfire. You know, right. you're, you're hearing that ghost story, and it gives you the creeps, and it's really entertaining, but you really don't believe in ghosts. And so I have students who say, well, it's like that for me. Giorgio's funny. Um, not intentionally, but we think it's funny. We think, and there are a lot of, there's a lot of interesting visuals, and so that we don't believe any of that, but that's why we watch the show. Um, if we can even turn this back further. Um, Elizabeth Bird, who is an anthropologist who did an anthropological study of the old, um, uh, like, Weekly World News, the old uh, newspaper, supermarket tabloids, and and a, a lot of the people she talked to about those say, oh, we know none of this is true, but we just think it's entertaining. Um, for those people, okay, the advantages are in my class, and now I've got them, okay? Now I can say, hey, here's what we actually know. In a number of cases, I've actually received emails from folks who've seen me on TV who have said, Vader, you're, you're full of it, you don't know anything. And I said, look, 
they gave me two minutes on that show. Here are a couple of books to look at. Write me back when you've looked at these books and about ancient Egypt, Egyptians building the pyramids, for example. And in a couple of cases, people have written me back and say, wow, I didn't know you archaeologists knew so much about this stuff. I said, well, yeah, because you're not <laughs> going to see that on these, on these, these um, edutainment uh, um, documentaries. But there is a darker underbelly, which is there's, there's a certain portion of the population who thinks that there's this conspiracy on the part of scientists and and liberals and Jews and we're all in it together and yeah. it's it's not unrelated to fake news and PizzaGate and and um, the, the the idea that the the kids who got killed in Newtown, Connecticut were all crisis actors oh, and that yeah. really didn't happen. So there's this feeling that if somebody in a position of authority like a professor is saying it, it's part of some evil plot to keep the truth from us. Um, and that's and I've ac I've actually had emails from people who said, Fader, I know you know what's going on, and you're I don't know why, but you're trying to hide it about Egypt or whatever. And so the, the part of this there's there's a racist a racial undercurrent that well no those those benighted brown people in Africa could not have accomplished those amazing things. They must have had help from the outside. And it could be Atlantis, and it could be ancient aliens, or it can be some super white race that predates all civilization as we know it. But there's this, 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 at least the impression I get from some people is that we are part of a conspiracy to keep them quiet, to keep, to keep, to, to, to keep them uninformed about the real deal and that, you know, reptilians from Alpha Centauri are actually running the government. And it's all part of the same thing. Archaeology is one little section segment of it, but they're all somehow interconnected. People in authority are trying, it's a, we're part of a conspiracy, to keep the truth from those folks out there across the fruited plain. I want to get Jim. I gotta tell you, buddy. I'm not trying to keep the truth from anybody. I don't have that kind of power. <laughs> right? Yeah. Exactly. Most of us <laughs> don't. We we only wish we did. Ken, I want to get James in here real quick. Let me just quickly follow up. I've written articles in the past too, trying to point out the fact that the information that people claim is a conspiracy or that is being covered up is readily available if you know where to look for it. And although I've got a lot of friends who write for magazines like Skeptic Inquirer. You know, Bob Laskowitz, who's an educator, he's a friend of mine. I don't know if you guys know Bob. Uh, but, you know, the, these are people who we all try to take a measured approach to all this. And, uh, and, and nonetheless, though, I've been attacked both by people who are advocates of the idea of the conspiracies and also a few prominent skeptics. And the, the thing is, is that I really think that there has to be a cohesive message and the things fundamentally that we have to recognize. We spoke on this podcast with Dr. Bradley Lepper a few months back. Oh, we, yeah. Brad's a good Brad, friend of mine. Brad's good a good colleague. guy. Wonderful guy. And uh, there's a funny story. We almost met him while we were at Mound City, Ohio ourselves, but we'll save that for another time. But we asked him the same question. What, what is your take on this, and is it damaging, belief in these kind of things? And Brad said it best. He said, it's a strong term, but I'm going to use it. There are racial uh, undertones to this, and there mm -hmm. is this attitude among these pseudo-archaeologists that that we can say that it was this or that it was that, which takes so much away from these ancient cultures and traditions. And so I'm so glad that you point that out, Kim, because I think not only is it important that we address that and the insidious nature of that and, and fringe beliefs as it relates to these kind of things, but also being friendly and approachable as skeptics in the community who can educate people and bring others to this argument. That is something that is so important. And I'll, I'll quit uh, uh, soapboxing here. I want to toss it to James. I know you've got a question you want to get in for, the, for our guests. Well, yeah, I just wanted to make a just a couple of statements, maybe ask a question or two. But uh, Ken, you know, you were talking about you know reading these books like *Chariots of the Gods* or whatever back in the back in the seventies. I'm right there with you. I did the same thing, and it, that's exactly what it was like. It was like intellectual porn for for young boys, and it, it was super fascinating to me. I mean, for all the same reasons that probably it is to everybody else. And you know, you're talking about the cons the the uh, conspiracy of academia and you know people in power made me think of the the movie they like if only if we uh they live we only had special sunglasses you know they oh, see. that is such a good movie <laughs> yeah <laughs> i love the movie so uh one no, thing no, though we've that, been talking hey, about I'll, porn a lot here are we gonna need a parental <laughs> advisory sticker over this podcast? i'll be sure and add one <laughs> <laughs> there you go, there you go. but that's you know that, that i have on a number of occasions people have accused either me per, me directly personally or my 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 colleagues 
of of conspiring to keep the truth about antiquity from them. Yeah. And I, I my response to that is always if you think that a group of archaeologists could do that, you don't know enough archaeologists. Yes. You've never been to an archaeological conference yeah. and see all, all these guys down and be, you know, once you have, you get a few beers in an archaeologist and they'll tell you everything. And so yeah. it's it, it really isn't the case that that we 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 know, we know where the secret artifacts are found that prove that what the, there were ancient Celtic kingdoms in the New World, or that Africans were the inspiration for the Olmec civilization, or that Atlantis sent out ships uh, as it was as it was sinking uh, to Egypt and to Mesopotamia and to North America and South America and shared their their um, uh, cultural sophistication with them. Honest to God, if we we are not hiding that because we've never found any evidence for that. So we're not yeah. part of a conspiracy. Our, the, our goal, the goal of all archaeologists is to is to illuminate what happened in the past because we think that's really interesting. And I think that I think it's ultimately the goal of all archaeologists who I know to not just share that amongst ourselves, not just to share that within the archaeological community, but to share that with folks who find antiquity fascinating and the kinds of folks who you know, I, mean, I tell this to people all the time when i you know when i meet people whether it's you know especially when i was younger going to a bar or at a party and they say what do you do and i say i'm an archaeologist invariably invariably the answer is wow i've always been interested in that and right. i tell my students i tell my students they say look if you're an accounting major i hate to break it to you folks it's a it's a noble profession but if you go to a bar or a party and people ask what you do and you say you're an accountant, nobody is ever going to say to you, ooh, I've always been interested in that. And so we have a responsibility. When we're in a discipline that generates a tremendous amount of interest to share what we know with folks. And, to, as, and, as, and as part of that is to share what we know ain't so. And the stuff you see on Ancient Aliens or on America on Earth and a bunch of other shows it ain't so, folks. The evidence does not support those claims. You know, our money, as I'm a geologist, you're an archaeologist. We're basically cut from the same cloth in a lot of ways. And the, where we make our money at in this stuff is is our interpretation of the evidence. So um, so when I think when people see a lot of this, uh, you know, a lot of this uh, stuff from antiquity, it's almost like a, a Rorschach test. There's a, you know, there's a certain psychology to it where you overlay on those things, what, you know, sort of what you want it to be or what in, in your mind, what, you know, what happened in the past. Um, we have a way of like overlaying our morals and our culture and our, our, we see things through our own filters. And that's how these things sort of get to lost civilizations or Atlantis or ancient aliens or, you know, or whatever. It's, it's, it's that, and it's the, this filter of, well, my God, I can't imagine those ancient brown skinned people. Let's, let's put it and say it the way it is having accomplished all that so that filters out the local folks or local people could be responsible and then you're right this overlay of what their preconceptions are james you're a geologist i am yes yeah here's my, my favorite geology story right so i was giving a <laughs> lecture i was giving a lecture about the cardiff giant which is this, oh. this wonderful archaeological fraud from the middle of the 19th century in favorite New York State. Mine. yeah and at the end of the lecture this gentleman comes up to me with these large binders filled with photographs and he says, well, these aren't archaeological hoaxes, are they? And James, they were, they were, from what I could tell in the photographs, it was picture after picture after picture of glacial erratics. These large <laughs> stones out of place because a glacier moved them away from their source. So I, I gave him the whole line about how well as an archaeologist, I know a little bit about geology, and I explained that I'm pretty sure these are, are erratics. And his response was really priceless. And it was, and he was very nice about it. He said, Dr. Fader... I don't know anything about geology, but I know those are not erratics. Huh. Now, think about that for a while. And I, I tell my students, case, if, case you, can ever yeah, that's if you can ever preference a statement with, I don't know anything about, the only reasonable thing for you to do at that point is to be quiet, <laughs> is not to share your opinion, because you've just said, I don't know hey. anything about this. Ken, that man had an opinion, and he needed to be heard. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, that's fine, and he has a right to be heard. But you know, I, you know, it's what was the? Is it the old Mark Twain line that it's better 
to be quiet and to not say anything and have people think you a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. Yep. I, you know, I like to, those are words to live by, I think. They certainly are. Speaking of words, Sarah, I know you want to jump in here, please. I just wanted to go back to what you, I believe this is Micah, was saying uh, earlier, is the um, the concept of the skeptic community. Mm-hmm. Um I was very, I'm very much a part of the skeptic community. I've worked with CFI a few times back in Indianapolis, and then we moved. Um, we do, the skeptic community kind of has the same problem. They, they're very closed off uh, at times from the general population, I guess. But it's this, they make themselves very unapproachable, I yeah. think. And it, it was a problem I always had with the skeptic community. It, was, it can be very unfriendly, and it can be very single outing. And if you... If you are a skeptic and you don't toe the line exactly, you can find yourself on the wrong side of it very quickly. So I think what you were saying there is very important. Like the skeptic community needs to open up. It needs to learn how to talk to people without attacking them right off the bat, uh, without you know telling people they're stupid for thinking something. Because I think the other problem that's occurring, like with Ken, your story is actually perfect because I don't think people understand what we mean when we say show us evidence that guy honest to god thought he was showing you evidence and you were rejecting it yeah the problem is is i don't think he understood that's not evidence we encounter that a lot when people come to us with a story or an email or pictures and like oh i found this this must be evidence of and it's like it's not that's not that, that's not what we're looking for. That's not what we mean when we say evidence. Yeah, Sarah, you raised so many great points right there. And, you know, I'll just kind of summarize it like this. Uh, Michael Shermer is one, for instance, as a skeptic who he says, and, and I've retweeted him and quoted him many times in articles and things about this. He'll say, when you engage people who have fringe beliefs, talk to them, hear what they have to say, and then say, now, what would it take to bring you to my perspective on these things? Let's Let's talk about your beliefs and whether they're logical, whether there is you know, evidence that validates these perspectives. And I think that is the most important thing maybe that skeptics could do is rather than resorting to ad hominem and attacking other skeptics mm-hmm. or, or attacking even fringe believers, uh, can we not think of ourselves almost as missionaries in a way in the sense that we want to reach out to people and we want to say, hey, okay, not to attack your beliefs, but let's just ask some hard questions and let's all in the spirit of intellectual honesty try and understand each other's perspectives, but look at what the evidence suggests. And so here at Seven Ages, we get emails all the time from people saying, what do you guys think about, uh, you know, insert your conspiracy theory or whatever crazy idea. And we don't want to marginalize those people. We want to actually say, hey, okay, interesting subject. Now, we don't see a lot of evidence for that. Check out some of the articles at our website. And, you know, check out some of the discoveries that are occurring in North American archaeology that are appearing in peer-reviewed papers. This stuff, like Jason said earlier, is just as interesting. But I find mm-hmm. that being friendly and approachable about it is a much better way to bring people to interest in this subject rather than attacking and further marginalizing them. If you guys have any thoughts, please. Uh, my th- my, I mean, I, I largely agree with you, but you're always there. Well, the, the problem here is that there is, and I don't know what the percentages are, but there is an element... It's it's uh, I'll, I'll I'll give you an example sure. of of um, a, a person who attacked something that I had said, and it was pretty clear that this guy was an American Nazi. Oh well, yeah. that's not a person who I'm going to have a conversation with. No, I, I don't. Yeah. Here's, the, here's the deal. I don't know if you guys, do you guys, um, I, I won't say the words. Okay. But you know, you know how people talk about trigger words. Sure. In, in I when I get emails, I look for trigger words in the in the subject line, and there you know when people are in that subject line, and people are, are responding to something that I wrote or something I said on television, and they're responding with the, you know they're f bombing me, yeah. or calling me an a hole or whatever. That's not an invitation to a conversation that I want to have. Good and point. so I, I'm not. I think for those people, there's nothing I say or do that's going to bring them over to the side of of righteous knowledge and there are i don't know what the what the numbers are what the percentages are but there are people who are so committed to that those perspectives that there isn't really a conversation and i i am sorry to have to say this but there's not even there's not a conversation to be had but there's a lot of folks out there in the middle going oh i watch ancient aliens and it sounds kind of cool what about that stuff those people are certainly reachable, yeah. and, 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 and they want to hear, what do archaeologists really say about this? 
The problem is, is you never know when those people are simply observing a conversation. And, and I'm completely with you. Like, it's a waste of energy to try to engage people like the, the, the right wing neo-Nazis or people who would qualify as true believers in a conspiracy theory. But at the same time, it is worthwhile to maybe throw out one or two comments about you should go check this out because this is the problem with your argument. Because somebody, somebody who isn't willing to speak up or, or say anything or someone who's just sitting on the fence and just watching, they're going to go to those resources and they're going to hopefully make a decision based on evidence and not based on um, appeals to emotion, which is what you're getting when you're when you're talking to the sure. to you know the the right and the, the these other people. Um, so yeah, I mean it's a really fine line of when how much do I engage? When do I stop engaging? I mean I figure like one comment of no you're wrong and this is why you're wrong is perfectly acceptable when dealing with those kind of people. But when you get somebody who comes to you and they're genuinely curious and they're like this sounds feasible but I not 100% sure. Those are the well, people you really need to be talking to. Yeah, I mean, Sarah and, and Jeb and, and I with Jennifer Raff, who's a geneticist, did a podcast on the Solutrean hypothesis, this notion that, gee, maybe um, there was a movement God. of people at the end of the that Pleistocene or late Pleistocene across the Atlantic. Um, and that's fine. We, we had that conversation, and it was a rational conversation yeah. about, look, the evidence doesn't show you, blah, blah, blah. But we also understand that there are Nazi websites that yeah. have embraced that to prove that <laughs> the first Americans were actually white people. Yeah. White people were here first, and so the hell with the Indians. And you know, I'm I, for example, I'm not going to post on one of those websites and say, "Well, guys, oh God, wait no. a minute, here's oh here's God. the evidence." So, so you're right. In, in any one of these instances, there's there's there are people who want a conversation. And we'll either convince them or not. But there are people who are not looking for a conversation. Oh, yeah. Because people for, are just looking fight. Yeah. yeah. Right. Exactly. And you both raise such good points. You know, again, Sarah, like you said, there are instances where sometimes it's important to throw out a few kernels of knowledge. Ken, on the other hand, and I couldn't agree with you more. And thank you for pointing out that uh, as our friend uh, uh, James Adavazio uh, had referred to on both sides of the fence. There are the irredeemable academic types who say don't work with avocationalists and, and people who aren't credited right. archaeologists. But you, you find a lot of that also in the people who are uneducated, who don't have a true grasp on things. They have ideological perspectives, and when it gets really scary, sometimes those things are not just fringe beliefs, but they also are you know tied to nationalism and a lot of very unsavory mm -hmm. things. So like you said, Ken in equal measure, there are certain people that it's useless to engage with. But when we have people, I think, who are open to conversation and you might be able to bring them to the dark side, so to speak, you know, it's, I think, our duty uh, as educators of any kind to try and do that. And, and let me just say this. This is something I appreciate about the two of you so much and your podcast. I think that you guys can, you have such a track record, a history of being such a, a friendly approachable person you make these subjects fun but you are always speaking for science whether it's on a television program or on a podcast like this i want to thank you both for that and remind our listeners that we're talking with ken fader and sarah head co-hosts of the archie fantasies podcast it's our pleasure to have them here on the seven ages audio journal and guys listen we would be remiss at this point if we didn't at least bring up one of the many a words that's been dropped tonight and i don't mean attorneys i don't mean accountants <laughs> i don't even mean ancient aliens i mean atlantis oh, yeah, dear God. yeah ken i know you <laughs> I'm, I'm someone who i've loved the classics for a long time i've read a lot of plato and, I, and people constantly ask me, what do you think about Atlantis? And I'm like, well, have you read Plato? He wrote dialogues that were <laughs> philosophical dialogues intent on instructing us on philosophical truths. And yet some people seem to think that he's a historian as well. Ken, I know you've chimed in on this an awful lot. I'd love to hear your yeah. thoughts on Atlantis. Well, the deal is, I, I, I yes. I mean, for, there was a time, well, I guess in the late 90s and early 2000s when um, – I was getting a lot of phone calls from documentary producers who were doing shows about Atlantis. So that that was a real popular thing, and I got to the point where I, you know, where they would call me up and they say, "Yeah, Ken, we want to know the archaeological um, perspective on this 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 perfect society, uh, this Atlantis." And I said, and I say, I said to them, I would always, I got to the point where I would say to them, "What you need to do before we talk is you have to go back and read Plato, yep. because in what you've just said." you have exemplified the fact that you have not read Plato 
and you don't understand that the perfect society in those dialogues was Athens. Atlantis was the foil. They, I, I tell this to my students. They, they were the baddies. About, they yeah. get it about halfway through. I say, look, um, here's the story, right? The, the story is um, a, a very powerful, a, a society that is economically very wealthy, that is that is technologically extremely sophisticated, militarily very powerful, that is attempting to take over its known universe. And the only thing standing in their way is a small group of ragtag rebels, but rebels, but they're living, they're gonna succeed because you know the force is with them. And people say, Oh, that's that's Star Wars. And I go, No, no, no. Oh, Star Wars? Oh, I didn't think of that. No, I'm talking about Atlantis. Because that's the Atlantis story. The evil empire is 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 Atlantis. And the uh, the ancient Athenians, who are not as economically wealthy, not as militarily powerful, not as technologically sophisticated, but what they've got is they're living the perfect society, which by no coincidence is exactly what Plato talked about in the Republic. Right. So they're, the force is with them. And then when you start thinking about it that way, then nobody nobody believes that the I, I hope I hope I hope nobody believes that the uh, the empire is really out there that that's a true story but you know that's science fiction that's a bunch of movies that's exactly what plato was doing he was ta he was teaching a lesson about how the perfect society again even though small even though not as powerful as an enemy if they're living the perfect life they will rise to the occasion and if you read plato if you read timius and critias it's really very clearly there when Socrates says, well, remember that perfect society we were talking about? Can somebody tell me a story about that society at war? Because talking about it uh, theoretically, it's kind of like looking at a painting of an animal at rest. And I don't really get the essence of that animal until it's it's been threatened, until we, we see it in action. And that's what Plato was that's what Plato was doing through Socrates. The other thing that bothers me about that is that people will say constantly, yeah, but Plato said it was a true story. I said, no, 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 Plato didn't say it was a true story. Plato puts words in the mouth of Critias. Critias says it's a true story. But, you know, Shakespeare has Dick the Butcher say, first thing we should do is <laughs> kill, all the, kill all the lawyers. So did Shakespeare say we should kill lawyers? No, a character in a play did. Did Plato say Atlantis was real? No, a character in a dialogue that was entirely fic fictional. He has him say that. That's a really because good... Because you know what? Yeah. The Atlantis story wouldn't be very exciting if, if Plato... If, if, Socrates asks his students, well, does anybody have a story to exemplify a perfect society, you know, rising to the occasion and fighting a war? And if Critias had said, yep, yeah, Socrates, I have the story, and I'm just making it up, <laughs> that, it, that removes all of the dramatic impact. He's got to say, now, you know what? Amazingly, you won't believe it, Socrates, but the story is true, and it sounds just like that, that, what we were talking about in theory the other day uh, when uh, referring to the Republic. In the past, you know, when I've read Plato, Ken, I, I've actually had it in my mind. I, I try to pretend I'm reading Shakespeare and like this is a play, like Plato is giving us a dialogue between characters, because that's essentially what it is. Now, we, yeah, sure. we understand that there was a historical Socrates. Many of the other characters in Plato's dialogues were also historical figures. It's disputed whether some of them were, and this was brought up recently to me also, and I think it's important because I've, I've tried to understand at the base of the Atlantis legends what it is that leads more people to understand this as history rather than, again, a typical Platonic dialogue. And we look at, for instance, you know, in Timaeus and, and Critias, we see these documents make references not only to this, this allegory of this war between nations, but also of Solon traveling to Egypt and speaking to an an elderly priest who tells him about, well, here are the things that you in, in, in Greece have forgotten about your past. Right. Um, there is a lot of dispute, however. I believe it was Song Kiss of Saïs, if, if memory serves, was the, the, the priest. There's dispute over whether he even existed. I would love to get your take as an archaeologist and a professional on this uh, about the historicity of that narrative and some of the characters that Plato mentions in the Timaeus Dialogue. Well, it's somebody like Critias is a real person. Hermocrates is a real person. Um, it's not clear in it. Some of them didn't live at the same time. You know, the Plato, when Plato positions this dialogue at a time when he would have been like nine years old. So it's not like he overheard this right. uh, because he was way too young. Um, the, 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 what, what Plato did reminds me of, there was a television show on PBS um, years and years ago, and it was produced by Steve Allen, this kind of Renaissance man, right, who was a, a, 
he did the Tonight Show before anybody else did. He was a, a writer and a musician. And in a meeting of minds, it was really cool. What they would do is they would take four or five historical characters mm -hmm. and they would give the roles of those characters to actors whose job it was to kind of read stuff about them. And then they would put them around a table in makeup and say, okay, um, let's talk about a, a subject. And they had to talk about that subject from as best they could, the perspective of the people they were representing. And I remember there was one in which the topic was slavery, and I think it was Cleopatra, Abraham Lincoln, Gandhi, and I think Genghis Khan sitting around a table discussing slavery. Now, of course, that didn't happen, but it's kind of an interesting approach. Oh, sure. And, you know, Plato basically was doing the same thing taking these folks, some of whom are iconic, so we kind of know what they would have said, and putting them together in a room and discussing stuff. As far as this, the story of, of Solon getting this information from Egyptian priests, um, no, no notion that there's no evidence for that. There's no evidence for any documents in Egypt talking about this place called Atlantis. Right. And plus, that, that the, other, the other connection to Star Wars is, you know, that scroll at the beginning of Star Wars, you know, what is it, long long, long ago and far away, <laughs> oh, yeah. Plato, Plato puts Atlantis in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, which for the ancient Greeks was like really far away. They had no idea what was there. And he puts it 9,000 years before Plato's time. So a real long time ago. So Plato very clearly is placing this in a world that is completely inaccessible. You can't go looking for this. You, you, you know, it's so far back in time. And he does that on purpose so, so people understand, oh, this is like like a, a, a mythic time and a mythic place, and that's the point. Yeah, very well said. Well, as the clock's running here, and there's there's many, many things we'd like to get to, unfortunately, we won't be able to get to them all tonight, but I think we'd be remiss, being that we have our geologist here with us tonight, James, uh, if we didn't talk for at least a couple of minutes about the Koso Artifact. So I know I've heard this on, on Archaeological Fantasies podcast. You guys cover a plethora of great subjects on there. I really, really enjoy listening to your show. Um, it's always entertaining, and, and it's always good for getting information out there. But this particular one, the Koso Artifact, I've heard referred to many, many times by those who believe that the Earth is much older than they say it is and that there's these ancient super civilizations that have been lost to the ravages of time. But let's begin with a, a brief conversation about what the artifact is and uh, James, you can pick it up with the geology side of it. The, the, the spark plug, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, you know, it's it's a spark plug, and it's encased in uh, it's encased in rock, isn't it? Is it limestone? It appears to be. The, yeah. yeah. Looks kind of like a, a concretion. Right, concretion, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an iron a concretion that's formed yeah. around the the spark plug. And the spark plug is even recognizable. That I mean, the I guess believe it or not, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff I don't believe, but I would not have believed. That there are people who are experts in the 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 evolution and development of spark plugs, <laughs> and you, they see a part of a spark plug and get, they can tell you who made it, when it was made, what years, and what machine it was in. And I guess that somebody has looked at the Koso artifact and he can identify exactly the spark plug, the years it was manufactured, and who made it. Yeah, they had several people respond back with them. With not only did they told them to make the model of the spark plug, but a couple of them actually sent them unencased spark plugs. And yeah, when you compare the picture to the actual spark plug, it's it's identical. Yeah. But let's hear it from a geologist. How is it possible that yeah, a yeah. Tell spark us how plug only born. decades old can be find it, found in solid rock? For James Waldo yeah. of Savannah, Georgia, opportunity knocks. Take it away there, buddy. <laughs> I just happened to be on the scene. Well, you know, the, originally they had said this thing was in a in a geode, but if you look at the cross section of it, and, well, let me back up. I remember seeing this in a book when I was a kid, and I thought it was fascinating. Um, it looks like it, you know, it's it in the picture. It looks like a geode, but if you really look at the cross section, and you know what a geode looks like, it doesn't look like right. a geode at all. It, yeah. And you yeah. can literally see, you know, when when iron and uh, and uh, steel uh, weather, uh, you know, it, they oxidize. And it'll actually build, it'll actually, the, the object will actually get bigger. It'll grow rust, essentially. So this thing's laying in the, in the ground, and it just basically solidified the, uh, the soil around it and sort of formed a concretion, uh, basically is what it is. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what was interesting, one of the things that was interesting to me later as I, you know, learned about these things or whatever is 
how people do not apply critical thinking or, you know, Occam's razor to these things instead of going, well, you know, this thing probably just rusts it in place. There's no, you know, ancient civilization that's going to make a, you know, a champion spark plug and, you know, identical to what we produce later. Or they go straight to time travelers, right? <laughs> that could be. Yeah, you don't know. What, what, I do like the time traveler theories what, that go along with the Kosovo. Now, guys, things. we know that good science requires a test for falsehood. So my question is, who has identified, who here knows what model of vehicle that this spark plug would have fitted? Anybody? It had to be I a Ford. I don't remember. Somebody has, has, has figured it out. I want to say say large, so I but say I don't remember Ford, it off the top of my head. Know. Well, no, it's not. It's, it's not. Funny, it's, so you only have it's so not many a choices. vehicle. It's a, it's a piece I'm of machinery. Going with Ford. Is it? Well, bottom line is, I'm just trying to say it wasn't Marty McFly in a DeLorean, right? <laughs> it was not. No, no, it was not a DeLorean. Point twenty one watts. Yeah. In, in other words, I mean, it makes so much sense that time travelers would take an antiquated Ford vehicle, retrofit it, of course, because we like anachronisms, and travel back to the desert in the middle of nowhere, drop a spark plug. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Guys, it's been such a great conversation. Uh, and, Ken, I, I do want to come to you real quickly here at the very end of things because you've got a new book coming out next year. Is that correct? You know, I always have a new book. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Yep. In fact, I, uh, I'm not even sure what the title is at this point. But I, I, I'm not really. You know, I, 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 people will think I'm shamelessly flogging a book now, and I'm not. I'm because very you much, are. I'm very much ashamed. <laughs> yeah. But a couple of years ago, I wrote a book, uh, Ancient America: Fifty Archaeological Sites to See for Yourself, which was, in a way, it was this. This. Hey, listen. I've been debunking so much stuff. I want to to kind of proactively. Um, encourage people to go and engage with archaeology. There are so many wonderful, um, well-researched sites here in the United States that are open to the public. They're on national parkland, national monuments, uh, state parks, that you can see what archaeology has actually um, shown about human antiquity, American antiquity. So I want people to do that. And so don't just get your stuff from TV. Get it directly by by visiting these sites and talking to park rangers and talking to archaeologists and while i was when that book went to bed when when we were, it was ready sent off to the, pr the printer the um my my editor said okay ken when are you gonna start working on ancient america 2 and it was one of those moments where my my brain kind of froze and i said oh god i don't want to do another one of these it was so much work but i can but you know somebody asks me if i want to write another book of course there's somewhere in the back of my head i i, I spout out oh well how about, you know, I'm interested in archaeological frauds. How about, like, the companion book to Ancient America, which is real sites, you know, 30 or 40 or 50 fake sites that are open to the public, that are either archaeological fallacies, fo follies, or sites that are misrepresented, or sites that have been misinterpreted, or completely fake. And I thought, yeah, there's no way the publisher will buy that. And, and well, they did. And so uh, I think it's I think the, the, the title now is Archaeological Oddities. And it, it will be, it's a field guide to sites like uh, Mystery Hill and like the the um, Black Dragon Canyon pterodactyl pictograph <laughs> and the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, in of all places in New Mexico. And how, how you can visit those places, but how archaeology and history has explained those things, how we know what they are and how we know what they're not. And it was a total, just a gas doing it. A lot of fun. Got to see a lot of cool places. And it's it's actually 40 sites. Um, and they're not all fake, and they're not all to be debunked. Some of them are just kind of silly things. Carhenge is in my list, you know, the, the <laughs> yeah. replica of Stonehenge. But how people embrace archaeology and embrace, you know, emblems of archaeology and incorporate them into even pretty silly stuff. So it's great fun. And that will be out, Roman and Littlefield. But in the meantime, you know, pick up a copy of uh, Frauds, Myths, and Mysteries, my book on archaeological frauds, myths, and mysteries, or Ancient America, 50 Archaeological Sites, See for Yourself, and dedicate, hell, dedicate an entire shelf in, uh, in your bookcase in your house to Ken Fader's books, and I'll be a happy guy. Hey, I'd be happy to do that. I want all those books. Now, as Kara Cooney said, guys, I want all the things. And, yeah, in fact, go. I'm already thinking of a future episode. we got to have you guys back because this has been arguably, I think, the, the funnest show that we've done. Sarah, also, I want to put it out to you. How can folks find your work online with this podcast and your related endeavors? The podcast is on the archaeological fantasy. If you just go to archiefantasies.com, 
Uh, you can access the podcast from there. You can also subscribe to it on iTunes and Spotify. You can read the blog while you're there because there is a blog component. And I would appreciate people doing so and commenting. What an incredible interview with Ken and Sarah. Honestly, guys, I could have talked to them all night. I can't believe an hour went by that fast. There was at least 15 other things I wanted to touch on. So we're definitely going to have to have both of those back, both of these guys back on the show at some point in the future. But thanks again to both Sarah Head and Ken Fetter for being our guest tonight. What an incredible interview. It was one of the funner interviews I think we've done. I truly, I mean, I've followed Ken's work for a long time. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of what he does. And I love their podcast. And, of course, Sarah, who uh, has worked also on the podcast, which we have featured on an earlier episode, The Women in Archaeology, we just love their approach and what they're doing for archaeology and what they contribute. And those girls talk about things that you don't hear about on any other podcast. So it's just a really eclectic group. They're really very invested in this, and they work very hard at what they do. And to have you know one of the, the, the famous women of archaeology there with Ken Fader, it was a great time. So, And of course, you know, talking about a subject that, let's just be honest here. Many of us got our start in this having taken an interest in those kind of subjects. I mean, many of us were interested in Atlantis, or many of us were interested in the so-called ancient astronaut theory. I know when I was a kid, I was interested in that stuff, and on up into my 20s, I still entertained some of those ideas. I was probably in my mid-20s when I really began to kind of go, you know, I don't see a whole lot of evidence for this. And I even was giving a lecture, one of the first public lectures I ever gave about anything having to do with history or anthropology I was talking about entheogens and altered states of consciousness, psychedelic substances and things like this in relation to ethnobotany. And my interest, I've maintained an interest in that for a very long time. And uh, I'd been booked at this event, and I was giving a talk with some of the stars from the Ancient Aliens show. And I remember getting up there, gosh, 25, 26, and telling the crowd, well, folks, so i got to be honest with you, I don't believe that aliens came to Earth in the ancient past and taught anybody from that period how to do anything. I want to give you a totally different perspective on the ancient past and things that might have been shaping people's minds and, and stimulating culture. Again, we've talked about this on the podcast in the past, guys, the role that alcohol also played in the possible formation of ideas and culture, even civilization over time. But again, it's just, to me, always been a pretty shaky argument to try and say, therefore, aliens. And I don't care how you wear your hair when you say it. <laughs> <laughs> Good point. Yeah. You know what? Uh, one thing I liked about that interview, especially when we got down towards the end of it, was let's ask a geologist. I thought, you know what? That was fun. Maybe we should incorporate it into the into every show. Ask the geologist. <laughs> well, that would be better than the weekly volcano update. Yeah, it could be. You know what? <laughs> that, that actually moves it at, 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 uh, on a geologic scale. So maybe it's not good for a you know, weekly update. <laughs> hey, yeah, right. But, but James, I will say, and coming back to my earlier point, many people kind of took the cue from pseudo-archaeology. We watched shows back in the day like In Search Of, and I remember as a young person watching In Search Of, I was fascinated with that show. And that's where I, of course, first saw the Koso artifact. The problem, of course, is that while many people, I think that pseudo-archaeology can be a sort of gateway drug for them, so to speak, if you really challenge yourself to be critically minded, and if you are really honestly looking for the truth and not just things that interest you, not just things that are fun, or not just things that fulfill your own sort of wishes or fantasies, if you really are going to study what we know about ourselves, what we know about the ancient past, human origins, 
and all these questions, you have to challenge your conceptions and your beliefs, and you have to also challenge yourself to study what history and what archaeology and what science can teach us about these things. And as fascinating as the Kosovo artifact was for me at one point, it was even more fascinating to learn about geological concretions or to learn about, again, the actual builders of the pyramids and how, again, you know, here's a, a far less sensational trope than the idea of aliens, but uh, the idea that the pyramids were built by slaves. This is something that I still hear people talk about even in modern times, although there's no archaeological or historical evidence to support that concept. And so you'll, you'll notice that it's not just related to far-out fringe claims. Often there are just misconceptions and fallacies, which nonetheless are promulgated because people take them at face value. Always be critically minded and question things that you are told. And frankly, if you want to study Egypt, go get a good book by Barry Kemp or one of the really good Egyptologists out there. Study what they have to say. Learn about the art. Learn about the architecture. Learn about the culture. But get it from a historical or an archaeological perspective. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Um, one of the things that I always kind of find myself doing, I think I've always been like this, is, is, you know, I'll hear some conjecture about something or an idea about something, and I'll think to myself, now, how did they get that idea? Or how did they get to that conclusion? You know, what, how, did, how did they get from not knowing anything about this to this, you know, to this, uh, to this uh, uh, conjecture about this? And uh, that's kind of the part that's sometimes fascinating is just learning how people come to certain kinds of conclusions, I think. James, I think you just said it, though, coming from not knowing anything about a subject to not knowing anything about a subject. <laughs> you know, <laughs> not funny how that works. Got most of it left, right? Well, you know, again, I have always kind of had one foot. We did a whole show about William R. Corliss and anomalies in science. I've always had one foot in that area of scientific anomalies. And, you know, I've, I've often enjoyed associating with people who might be, I would say, less skeptical than me. For instance, and I can't name him here, but I've got a friend who has a history of involvement with the space program. And he once said to me, I haven't got much time for skeptics. I said, really? How come? And he said, well, Micah, skeptics didn't get us to the moon. And I've often quoted him, though I've never named him, saying that because it was one of those moments where I understood that there is a case to be made for open-mindedness to scientific possibilities. And so... Anomalies of science, like we talked about on our episode about William R. Corliss, I think that those are something that, at very least, should be given a second look. But don't take anything at face value, especially when we have a known history of places like Egypt and Mesopotamia, ancient Greece. To, to know the history through archaeology and through the actual writings of people who were there and saw it firsthand, like Herodotus and others, and yet to think that there are those who would come along and try and rewrite these histories, having obviously not read them themselves. That's the problem. When there's good evidence to the contrary, you have to go with where the good evidence leads. And to think that there are people these days who say, well, to hell with what's been written, to hell with what the archaeologists and the Egyptologists have found. We want to believe this, and therefore we shall. You know, once again, do you believe it just because you, you want to? Do you believe it just because it makes you feel good? Do you just not want to change your mind? And fundamentally, have you ever looked at what history and science has to say about these things and how it might contrast with your beliefs? Those are the questions you've got to ask yourself. Well, I think those are, those are all important questions and something that you have to keep in mind when you're addressing these things. And as we mentioned in the interview, and as we'll say again here, a lot of times I think a lot of this is just entertainment for folks. Uh, sometimes they just want to put their feet up on the couch and they look at it as nothing more than that. But it is important to differentiate between what's real and what's scientifically based versus what's just sheerly made up off the top of someone's head. Or if there's another agenda behind it, a book deal, a TV show, advertising money, whatever it is that's driving that narrative, it's important to be aware of all those things. And something else to be aware of is that you can contact us again on all of our social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. We have new videos up on YouTube, so be sure to get over there and check those out. Also, you can find all of our articles, videos, and podcast links at sevenages.org. And most importantly, please take a moment to rate and review the show if you like what you hear so that others can find the show through iTunes, Apple Podcasts, 
and various other podcatchers. That's right. Rating and reviewing makes our little world go round. And don't forget, 7ages.org, you'll find some articles by us. The Galt article that we talked about earlier isn't the only one. We've got articles about the ancient Hopi culture. We've got propaganda throughout the ancient world. I'm a big fan of Alexander the Great. And, of course, that article talks about that. Don't miss James Waldo's article, Whiskey, Whiskey, Scotch, and Bourbon. And plenty of other great things. We're going to have one on medicine wheels showing up here in just the next few days that Jason also pinned. So lots of good stuff in addition to the podcast that you'll find right there at the website. Fellas, we spent a lot of time tonight talking about what is and what is not real, but I know that the pint glass in front of me is half full, or is it half empty? That's a philosophical question. The only way to solve it, I think, is to empty it and then refill it. So guys, before we head out of the Cross Time Pub, what do you say? Let's pony up one more time and do our due diligence. Into the free, fellas. Let's do it. That's right. And thanks again to all of you out there for joining us once again for a little journey through space and time. It is the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Audio Journal.